Right. Assalamualaikum, everyone. Welcome back to our Mindful Tuesday session with Sheikh Yasser Fasaga, uh, presented by the MAPS MCRC Community Clinic. Um, today, we have a very important topic, um, building off of um, what we spoke about last week, and our topic today is on community resiliency. Um, and Sheikh Yasser will, have, as usual, impart his wisdom on us, and we'll hopefully figure out a way to become more resilient as a community. Um, this whole month, we'll really be focusing on, on strengthening ourselves and the community, as um, um, especially from, from the havoc, like the pandemic has wreaked on all of our lives. Um, so we'll have this session today, another one next week. And then on March 23rd, inshallah, we're actually planning on an event with Nami Eastside, um, again, to listen, listen to your experiences on, about resiliency and how we can build a better community network to support your mental health needs, inshallah. So stay, stay tuned for that. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Sheikh Yasser. Thank you, Sheikh Yasser, for joining us today. Thank you again. Uh, bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. In the name of Allah, the compassionate, the most merciful. All praises due to Allah and may his peace and blessings be upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I begin by greeting you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May the peace and the blessings of Allah be upon all of you and your loved ones. Ya Rabbil Alameen, and thank you once again for joining, uh, for joining us here on Mindful Tuesdays. I've really been liking um, this series, and I also really like the, the sequence of how we're doing things. So if you joined us last week, we spoke about trauma, we spoke about collective trauma, we spoke about personal trauma. And then we said that there were some elements that would enable people, help them overcome the trauma that they have went through. And we defined trauma as any event that was either life-threatening that has had a lasting impact on the person physically or emotionally or psychologically. And there are many, many um, different examples of traumatic events. Uh, some can be related to violence, people who have been through war, people who have experienced physical violence against their own physical integrity, where their space was violated and their person, their being was actually endangered. And we also have the type of trauma where the person may have not been the direct recipient of the event or of the threat or the harm, but they were witnesses um, to that. And then we have what we call generational trauma, which is passed on from one generation to another collective trauma and racial trauma. And these are things that are experienced by a mass group of people that would be African-Americans, Native Americans, that would be the different tribes in Rwanda, for example, that would be Muslims after 9-11 and, and so on. So one of these factors that would actually help individuals and communities to overcome their trauma uh, smoothly would be this thing, and I think it was inspired by a, a question that was asked of one of our viewers, is really the concept of um, resilience. In, there is really no, I, I was trying to look up this notion, this term about resilience. In Arabic, I think it's called either takayyuf and sometimes referred to as muruna. But inshallah, this is what we will try to address um, this evening in the hopes that we all know how to build resilience, you know, look into our toolbox and see what type of tools do we have in order to further enhance our resilience. So when we speak about um, resilience, there are just so many definitions and we will look into four or maybe five of these um, definitions of what is it that we mean when we say that we're talking about resilience and what it means to be resilient. A pattern of positive adaptation in the context of past or present adversity. This is very simple, it is very concise and it's really nice, it's emphasizing that Adaptation is taking place, but it is a positive one that is taking place. In addition to that, it's either related to something that was happened in the past or something that is presently happening. Other people say that it is a set of inner resources, social competencies, and cultural strategies that permit individuals to not only survive, but recover. This is brilliant. I think that this a statement right here really is very telling. 
So the idea is not only about surviving, it is also about thriving. It is not just about outliving the trauma, it's also what happens to you after the trauma. It's not only to survive, but to recover or even thrive after stressful events, but also to draw from the experience to enhance subsequent functioning. It's a brilliant, brilliant um, definition, but it's also a little bit vague because we don't know what these inner resources are, what are these social competencies that they're talking about, or what are the cultural strategies that are being addressed, addressed here. Others have said, this is really, when we speak about resilience, we are really talking about the ability to return to the original form after being bent, compressed, or stretched out of shape. And maybe this is talking about uh, inanimate objects. Maybe that's how people describe metal or different um, elements. However, when we speak about inhumans, we're talking about the ability to recover quickly from disruptive change or misfortune without being overwhelmed or acting in dysfunctional or harmful ways. I think this one is also really brilliant. Ability to recover quickly. So it's not, it's not something that is stretched out or prolonged. And this is not to rush anybody um, in their grieving process, as we, will, as we will see. From disruptive change, it's not necessarily talking about just something that is traumatic, but it could also be a misfortune without being overwhelmed or acting in dysfunctional or harmful ways. Disruptive change, somebody lost their job, they had to relocate somewhere else. That would be a disruptive change, especially if they needed to uproot themselves, take their kids out of school and you know, maybe move away from their um, family and so on. Or a misfortune diagnosed with something um, chronic, dangerous, life-threatening, losing a loved one, and, and so on. And the key here is without being overwhelmed to the point that the person feels paralyzed and unable to move or acting in dysfunctional, harmful ways. People resorting to all kinds of self-medication. Alcoholism is a very common, popular one, unfortunately. Nowadays, also smoking marijuana is another common one. And, and so on. So these would be seen as uh, coping mechanisms, but they are poor coping mechanisms. Okay. Another definition, a couple more, inshallah, and we stop. Resilience means being able to adapt to life's misfortunes and setbacks. This is really, really um, interesting because it's not going on the different um, on the different examples of what that may mean, but it's also um, accepting this idea that life innately, inherently will have misfortunes and setback. And that actually is one of the closest definitions that I find to, to be within the spirit of Islam and the spirit of the Quran. And in a second, we will speak as to why that is. When you have resilience, according to this, you harness inner strength and rebound more quickly from a setback or a or a challenge. All right, why did I say why did they say that? This is the final one. Resilience implies that after an event, a person or community may not only be able to cope and recover, but also change to reflect different priorities arising from the disaster, from the disaster. Ask a person who just been told that they're diagnosed with um, may Allah protect us all uh, with cancer and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the recovery to all of those who may be going through this Ya Rabbil Alameen. You ask them, so what happens after you heard the news that you're diagnosed with this? And people will immediately say, my priorities change. What I thought was important is no longer that important. Now I have got my priorities set somewhere, um, set somewhere else. And now I'm really concerned about one, two, and three. So what just happened? Now they are coping, they are recovering, but also the change that took place has led them to reflect into different priorities arising from the disaster or the misfortune or the event that just took place. Ask people about COVID. 
and they will tell you, so what's going on right now? They will tell you that how COVID has impacted them. Because COVID for, for many people has really been a traumatic event. You're talking about children deprived from their social and um, you know, their ability to interact with their friends, that growth is no longer there. People under lockdown, uh, loved ones dying alone because people are not allowed to go into the hospital in some cases, or people just not able to give their loved ones a proper burial because you know their loved one died uh, of COVID. And if that was your case, our deepest condolences to you. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all the souls of those who have passed away and grant a speedy recovery to those who may be going, who may be going through this. But definitely there are these types of events that come to us. Not only do we seek to recover from that, but also we change our minds as far as what do we think is um, important at this, at this point? All right. So remember this definition. Resilience means being able to adapt to life's misfortunes and setbacks. The Quran makes it abundantly clear that the idea that life is going to come with its misfortunes and setbacks, this is something that is inherently in life itself. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Balad, um, Indeed, we have created man into a life of kabad, pain, toil, and trial. Muhammad Asad looks into this word kabad and he said, look, you can't really just use one word to describe kabad. In other translations, you may see distress, you may see misfortune, you may see pain. But Muhammad said is of the opinion that, look, there is a concept of pain, distress, hardship, toil, trial, and can only be translated and rendered in a compound expression, not a single word to a single word, but it has to be a compound expression like the one that he just used. We have created man into a life of pain, toil, and trial. And please remember, this idea is absolutely crucial. Um, why is this crucial? Because see what the Quran does is that it just prepares the believer. Now, let, me, let me put this differently. Let me put it this way. The way you see life determines how you live life. So for example, if you believe that life is a race, that you know it's whoever gets up in the morning, it's whoever works hardest, whoever. So, well, if you see life as a race, then the most important thing to you will be speed, because this is how you win, race, speed. Well, other people say that, that life is like a, a roller coaster. Sometimes you're up and sometimes you're down. Sometimes you're enjoying it. Sometimes it's difficult to say, well, yeah, but see a roller coaster, it's almost like you have no say. It's just life doing this to you and, and, and you are just stuck in that, you know, whatever that roller coaster is. And that is why in the Quran, in over 50 different places, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about al-hayat al-dunya, what this life is like, what this life is about. Well, why, why is that? Simply put, because again, the way you see life determines how you live life. So you want to engage with life and you want to engage with life as it really is, not, with a, well, not what it appears to be. And that's why in the hadith, for example, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says um, in the dua, Allahumma arini al ashya'a kama hiya. Oh Allah, give me the ability to see things as they really are, not what they appear to be. So in order to engage with reality, you have to be aware of this reality. And as we have pointed out before, that some people look and they say that, you know, questioning uh, whether this hadith is, is sound or not, but the meaning of it is actually absolutely um, beautiful. In another place, the Quran becomes, uh, gets a little bit more specific. Indeed, we have created man into a life of pain, toil, and trial. You just cannot escape life's stressors, like normal life stressors. And by the way, in the WHO, um, the WHO organization definition of mental health, because the tendency is that we speak of mental health as something wrong. 
So then how do I know that I am mentally healthy? So they say that it is having the ability to enjoy when life is good and also the ability to cope with life's normal stressors. The more you accept these normal stressors, then guess what? The easier life becomes. You're going to go to work in the morning. There will be traffic. You can complain all you want about the traffic. It will not make the traffic go away. Now, we all miss it now, of course. Uh, I would rather be stuck in traffic rather than being stuck at home. Inshallah, very soon we will, we, will be doing, um, we will be doing this. But that is just part of life. So the more we accept these things, actually, it will reflect also on our ability to, um, to show resilience. Another point that's also important that the Quran does, so now the Quran here speaks generally that life man is created into a life of pain, toil, and trial. Sometimes the Quran just says, specifically said that, and most certainly we shall try you, we shall examine you, try you by means of khawf, fear, Muhammad Asad says it's danger, jur, hunger, and and loss of worldly goods, of lives and of labors, fruits. Sometimes you would see this as produce, but give glad tidings unto those who are patient in adversity. So here the Quran gives examples that you will be tested. There will be some fear. There will be some hunger. There will be some um, loss, be it in the form of wealth, be it in the form of lives, or be it in the form of samarat. Now, samar can either mean fruit of your labor, or samar can also mean fruits, like the fruits that, the, that are the, the produce and the, and the fruits. But nevertheless, it, it, like, you will experience some kind of loss. You will experience some kind of fear, fear of failure, fear of like real fear for your own safety and well-being, for example, in some, in some cases. Jure, you will experience some kind of hunger. Um, not everybody is going to experience all of these things, but humanity, mankind will have a taste of every one um, of every one of these. Okay? And then Allah says, وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ And here is a hint to that resilience. وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ However, give glad tidings unto those who are patient in adversity. Give them glad tidings. Like after all of this, after experiencing the pain of a loss, the pain of fear, the pain of hunger, the pain of loss in lives, um, wealth, or uh, fruits of labor or fruits of produce, give them glad tidings. Why would you do that? Then Allah said about them, they are those who, when calamity befalls upon them, they say, verily, into Allah do we belong, and verily, into him we shall return. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And here is an expression of attitude on behalf of the believers. There is this attitude as far as, you know what, this may actually we actually will experience this. In fact, a Razi comments on this verse, and he said that Allah is not necessarily talking to people who have experienced this because it says, You shall most certainly be tested with this. Well, it's almost like preparing the believer that, look, life is just going to throw different things at you. And we say life, but also we're saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will facilitate for different tests and trials to happen um, to us. And chances are, at some point, we are going to experience a good number of these, of these things. So Arazi says that a believer here is forewarned about potentially this is going to happen. Not that a person lives in fear in advance, but the person is prepared mentally, and spiritually, that one day they will experience something like this in the hopes that their attitude is going to be one of sabr. Remember, we said that patience is not just about waiting. It's about waiting with a good attitude. That good attitude is now expressed in this statement, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. 
Verily, unto Allah do we belong, and verily, unto Him we shall return, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that everything happens by His will, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Love it. This is, this is really, really uh, lovely, and how, you know, like we said, the Quran is a very brave book, and unfortunately, many times read by a lot of cowards. Anyways, so just lo looking into this, what is what is resilience? Like, what, what does it mean to be resilient? What kind of skills do you need to have, or what kind of um, what kind of uh, people are resilient? What kind of factors play in there? So, what we're looking here at is so resilience is the ability to bounce back. But then also, what, is that, what does that look like? Well, it is about maybe. So we're just looking into this big, huge circle that ultimately leads into bouncing back. So what is it? It is adapting under pressure. Because remember, in normal circumstances, fine, everybody is cool. But now it is pressure. How are you when you are under uh, pressure? Do you lose it? Uh, do you freeze? What's going on with you? These people, they adapt. Thriving despite or because of pressure. So it's not just overcoming, it's not just remaining stagnant, but it's also the ability not only to recover, but also to thrive and survive as a result of that pressure or despite the presence of that pressure. Or being strengthened or improved by adversity. I love it, subhanAllah. You know what? May we always say that may we not be tested. And if we are tested, may, may we emerge better people than how we were before the um, before the test. Uh, you know, I people say that I was tested, man. I have not had a job for a year. But alhamdulillah, throughout that time, you know, I never lost it with my family, never took my anger on my kids. I never complained about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He always knew that I was in good hands. I always knew that Allah has something better for me. I was always trying to look into what is the wisdom behind this. And that is beautiful. When people have these types of attitudes, subhanaka ya rabbi, that is just unbelievable. I know a brother, I, and I did not know this about him. I see him at the masjid all the time. And he just had a big, huge smile on his face. Every time I see him, he had a big, huge smile on his face. So one day he comes to the masjid and he tells me, Sheikh, he said that my... My son has passed away. His son was only 13 years old and, and he passed away and, you know, go and bury him. And he comes a year later and he tells me, that Sheikh, um, my daughter passed away. La ilaha illallah, his daughter passed away. And then a year after he comes to me and goes, Sheikh, my third daughter passed away. And we go on. And what has happened is they had a rare um, disorder where they would just get to a certain age and they start regressing and the people around him had no idea what this person was going was going through but you look into them and subhanallah the way that we're just handling the misfortune that that was happening to them the grace that they had was just subhanallah un, unbelievable also people who are resilient are people who have positive emotions why is that important Positive emotions, they work as a buffer between us and depression, between us and anxiety, between us and negative moods. So harboring um, and nurturing positive emotions is crucial because that is part of the skills that are needed in order to improve our sense of resilience. Emotional flexibility versus emotional rigidity. The person is 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 aware of all the of all the ups and the downs that life sometimes gives and sometimes life takes. So they they are emotionally flexible. They're not fixated. They're not rigid. But you see that there is some flexibility out there. Positive response to change to them. Change is an opportunity. Maybe inshallah it will be for the better. Maybe inshallah. So positive attitude and positive response to, to change. Ability to foster good relationships. And that is about people who are resilient. You know, they, despite the differences with others, despite the fact that nobody is a direct Xerox copy of us, they have that ability. Control over own workflow rather than just 
allowing things to happen. No, they, 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 whatever it is that they're able to control, they do so. Ability to establish a sense of community at work. Brilliant, brilliant. I mean, these people are, you know, depending on uh, what trauma people may face, but they really have that ability to foster good relationships and also to establish a sense of community. These things, they put a person at a much better place in overcoming these life misfortunes and setback. What happened is that they, we say that these individuals are resilient. In the hadith, the Prophet says, and this is a beautiful hadith, عَجَبًا لِأَمْرِ الْمُؤْمِنِ وَأَمْرُهُ كُلُّهُ لَخَيْرِ Say that how wonderful are the affairs or is the affair of the believer. For his affairs are all good. And this applies only or this applies to no one but the believer. وَلَا يَكُونُ هَذَا إِلَّا لِلْمُؤْمِنِ how, how come? Or how so? If, some, if something good happens to him, he is grateful and thankful for it. And that is good for him. Because to show gratitude and being thankful, that is good for you, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said. If something bad happens to him, if a misfortune takes place, he bears it with patience. And that is also good for him. So what the scholars say that we are either in the state of shukur, gratitude and thankfulness, or we are in the state of sabr, patiently persevering. And then he said, the Prophet said, Ajaban, how wonderful, amazing is the affair of the believer. Like it's almost, if this happens, it's an opportunity to grow in this area. If this happens, it's an opportunity to grow in this, um, in this area. We also then, you know, this idea of resiliency and elasticity, an incredible in the way in this hadith that the Prophet says. The Prophet peace upon him said, He said that the example of a believer or the parable of a believer is that of a fresh, tender plant. What happens? He said that from whatever direction the wind comes, it bends it. However, uh, but when the wind becomes quiet, it becomes straight again. Brilliant. And just imagine that tender plant, the wind is blowing this way. So why is to resist? You just, you just go along. The wind subsides and then what happens? It comes up again. And then he said, However, a wicked, impious, wicked person is like a pine tree which keeps hard and straight till Allah cuts or breaks it down when he wishes subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here is this parable and, and the wind is a metaphor for life tests. It, it comes to the believer and then what happens is that the believer just, you know, at this point, this is what that smart um, plant is going to do. The wind is blowing this way, so it will just go along because there is just no, no point of resisting here. The wind goes away, it comes up again. The pine tree, and subhanAllah, I was looking into this, I was just looking into the internet, searching are, are pine trees easily uprooted? And the answer is absolutely yes. What happens is because they are taller and the taller they get, the more prone they become into being uprooted by the, by the wind or they are broken by the, um, by the wind. It puts them at a higher, at, at a higher um, risk. And then what happens is the Prophet peace be upon him said, this is a person that at the first test that they get, what happens is that they are, they are uprooted. They are just being, um, they're being cut off. Simply put, many times, life will throw these setbacks and misfortunes at us. And really at that point, many times, what the, 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 smartest, the smartest thing to do is acceptance. They said unto Allah, we, from Allah we are, unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we, we, uh, we belong. Um, I might have shared with you before the um, serenity prayers. Uh, where in it, it's a Christian prayer, it's a very famous prayer, and it's a beautiful prayer that a, a believer can say, Ameen to. 
And basically you pray and you say, oh God, give me the serenity, or give me the strength to change the things that I can change. And give me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change. And give me the wisdom to differentiate between them. It is absolutely brilliant. Allahumma ameen. So what happens sometimes is that the source of our misery, when we accept things that we can change, and we try to change things that we must accept, that literally becomes a source of misery. So in this hadith, in this beautiful example, the Prophet ﷺ said, look, the wind is blowing, and these tender plants are so smart, they just go along with it. The wind goes away, they come up again. This is like, you know, this is what happens with trials. And you just come, you just keep coming back again. You bounce back. You bounce back. This is what the Prophet ﷺ said. With resiliency, it is about the ability to adapt. When the wind is blowing, the wind goes away, you bounce back. Others are not going to do that. They are unable to adapt in, you know, in the presence of the wind. So what ends up happening is that they end up being, um, they end up being uprooted. And these are like beautiful teachings of how the Prophet sallallahu makes. By the way, also just a, a, a really nice, um, a really nice linguistical play with language here. So in Arabic, there are two ways of saying wind. We can either say rih and we can say riyah. Usually with riyah, you are thinking of a something that is very, very um, powerful. You are thinking of something that is extremely damaging. But here's the point that the Prophet وسلم, you know, when you give these examples, you don't want to be consumed by visualization that you lose the point. That's where the Prophet peace be upon him used the riyah. You know, it's just that light wind. It just comes there and it may come and, and come again and it may be sustained and it may be there for a few days. But eventually it goes away and then you come up um, and then you come up again. All right. Um, what is what is resilience and what is not resilience? And how are you if you have resilience? And how are you if you lack resilience? If you are resilient, here is what are your attitude and your beliefs are. Problems still happen. They still occur. It is part of life. Remember, Indeed, we have created man into a life of pain, toil, and trial. You just accept that. That is just part of life. We shall indeed try you with something, with a touch of examples of fear, loss of uh, lives, wealth, and fruits of labor or fruits of produce. So you just take this and say, well, you know, here comes my test. Subhanallah, life will always be like that. If you lack resilience, you are just going to dwell into the problem. I could have done that. Or maybe I should have, maybe I could have, and, but that's not good. It won't take care of the problem. It won't, it won't do anything to, um, uh, to, let, to make the problem go away. If you are resilient, you are able to find enjoyment in life. Not because your life is trouble free, but there is going to be things in life that are enjoyable and there are things in life that you just don't like. So you, these things that you don't like, you don't like, and the things that are enjoyable, you enjoy. However, if you lack resilience, not only do you dwell on the problems, but you also feel victimized. And again, that just drains the energy or makes you bitter or makes you resentful. If you are resilient, you can handle stress better. If you lack resilience, you become overwhelmed. And unfortunately, to many people, when that happens, they turn into unhealthy, negative, poor coping mechanism, such as substance abuse, smoking, sleeping excessively, um, uh, withdrawing or drinking or like really, really poor coping mechanism. So this is, this is, this is really good stuff. I really, I'm enjoying this. I, I really am. Wallahi, I promise you, I'm really enjoying this. And I just love our, um, our deen and how the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, they make such a big difference. And especially when we have the time to elaborate and, and explain 
pose um, on what the Prophet وسلم, said. It just becomes, you know, most of it is absolutely common sense. And I, and I tell people, say, look, I don't think that we are being taught anything that we didn't know. But I think what happens is that we've just reminded of many of these things that we have a tendency to forget sometimes. What is resilience and what is not resilience? This is also one of my favorite places and areas to look at. You encounter stress, adversity, trauma, tragedy, but you keep functioning both psychologically and physically. What we're not, we're not trying to make these things sound good. A loss is bad. Uh, loss of health is horrific. Loss of wealth is horrific. Loss of loved ones is terrible. We are not going to take these things and romanticize them. They really are bad. And, and, and you're not a better religious person because you tend to think of them as good. They're not. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِذَا أَصَابَتْكُمْ مُصِيبَةُ الْمَوْتِ He said that, when the calamity of death befalls upon you. It is a calamity. So it is a calamity. We want to say it like it is. However, when that happens, the, per the, the person is still able to function both psychologically as, as well as um, physically. What is it? You can go on with daily tasks, remain generally optimistic and go on with your, with your life. This is what happens when you are resilient. Yeah, that was really bad. You know, what happened was really not good. And, and then what happens? You bounce back and you are just, you know, wanting to regain your functionality one step at a time, one day at a time, taking your baby steps. And the idea is, inshallah, I am going to try to see if I can recuperate, rejuvenate, restore, and just be back, inshallah. Well, this is the resilience. What, is, what, what isn't resilience? Resilience does not mean you ignore your feelings. That is not healthy, people. That is not healthy at all. It does not mean that you ignore your feelings when um, tragedy strikes. You still experience anger, grief, and or pain. You still experience that. So you experiencing these things does not mean that you lack, you lack resilience. Attempting to deny yourself from these feelings isn't good either. And that is why, subhanAllah, when Ibrahim, the son of the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam, passed away. And remember, for the longest time, the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam did not have children, um, did not have boys specifically. And, you know, here he is blessed with Ibrahim and everybody is excited. You know, you know, back then the Arabs really valued the idea of having a boy. The Prophet wasallam loved all his daughters. And the one that he loved most whenever he was asked, he'd say Fatima. And then what happens is, so he's experiencing this loss and people see him and he's crying. And people are looking at him to say, wait a minute. He is the messenger of Allah. Why is he why is he crying? We thought you don't cry if you're the messenger of Allah. You're not supposed to. But then the Prophet said, He said that indeed my eyes are going to cry. My heart is broken. But I only say that which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So remember, resilience does not mean that you ignore. You acknowledge. Remember what he said? You validate. At the same time, remember, you still function spiritually, psychologically, and physically. Beautiful demonstration by the Prophet, peace be upon him. So you still feel these things. If a person is just sad, they're angry, and they are in pain, wallahi, it does not mean that they're weak. To the contrary, it just means that they are fully humans when they're experiencing these things. Being resilient does not mean being stoic or going um, going it alone. Stoic here meaning passive up here, like you know, you either ignore it or you just overlook it. That is not what it means. That is not what being resilient is. It is like we said, the ability to feel and at the same time function. Feel and at the same time find joy. Feel and at the same time. 
the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know, on the day of Eid, he would say sallallahu alaihi wasallam, these are uh, ayamu aklin wa shurbin wa farah. These are the days of eating and drinking, you know, at, towards the end of uh, of Hajj. He said these are days to for people to eat and to drink and to and to enjoy. Um, you are at a wedding. These are the times to enjoy. You are at a picnic. This is the time to enjoy. You are at a gathering. It's a time to engage socially. So, so the fact that you have pain does not necessarily mean that you just never enjoy um, enjoy um, anything. But this is really a nice way of like, what is it and what is and what it is not. So resilience is very important. Man, this is this is taking too long. My apologies, Nihaz. I promise you, inshallah, I'll try to get I'll try to get through this, inshallah. Resilience is important because subhanAllah, we all have been created with this innate capacity for resilience. We need to foster, we need to foster that. Interestingly, research also has shown that people who end up being more successful in life are those who experienced some adversity in childhood and learned how to cope. They're better prepared at that, at, that, um, at that point. Those who believe they are capable of handling challenges tend to remain emotionally stable. Remember, those who believe they are capable of handling challenges. Remember that verse that we just read from Surah Al-Baqarah with, with verse 155, that you shall indeed be tested? Said that, you know what, subhanAllah, you know, Allah said that we will be tested. So people who are already pre pre prepared like this, they tend to be emotionally more stable. Remember, not that we, we call um, misery upon ourselves. Not that misery is a time to rejoice and to... No, that's not, that's absolutely not it. Your anticipation is for the sake of preparedness, not for the sake of bringing about doom and gloom. Resilience helps us thrive. Remember, the idea is not to just live. It's not just to survive. It is also to overcome and to thrive. It enables us to develop a reservoir of internal resources that we can draw on when we need to. People who are resilient have better coping mechanisms in their toolbox. Think about all these internal resources as a big toolbox. Remember, the bigger your toolbox, the more tools you have, the more problems you are able to solve. So think of all like, what are your toolbox? Like, what are your toolbox? Some people would say, I've got prayers. I've got family support. I have got good routine. I have got good habits. I have developed, uh, you know, emotional flexibility. I have got, um, you know, I exercise, I meditate, I sleep well, I eat well. So each one of these is seen as a tool in your, in your toolbox. And then sometimes people may have toolbox there that they've never used. So in counseling, we uh, help people in finding these tools that they have. Sometimes they may have a tool that they're using, but not very effectively, or they're using it the wrong way. So people who are resilient, they build this reservoir or this toolbox with so many tools that would just help them um, overcome different challenges. Resiliency may protect us against developing mental illness related to stress or trauma. Remember, that, that, this is how we got into this topic to begin with. People who experience traumatic events, stressful events, now the more resilience they have, the less chances they have of developing mental health related issues. Resilience can help uh, us cope better with an existing mental illness that is so unbelievably true. You know, one thing that we do as clinicians when you have a client and they're experiencing mental health related issues is that you, 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 um, you make an assessment and evaluation as far as their insight is concerned and how resilient um, they are. So these are all different, different um, tools that you know what you can just look into. Self-care, sleep, nutrition, exercise, generate helpful thoughts, acceptance, being decisive, self-soothing, relaxation and meditation, hobbies and interests, social support in the form of friends, family and colleagues, realistic goal setting, meaningful activities, opportunities for learning after adversity. 
spirituality. These are all beautiful, beautiful examples of the different toolbox or the different tools in your toolbox that would actually enhance that sense of um, resilience. Okay, resilience skills, balance and recovery, emotional resilience, uh, and resilient um, uh, thinking. Uh, this is actually, you know, this I, I love this. This is actually part of a book, uh, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcer. This is interesting because it just tells you about us and animals. In this case, it is uh, the zebras. Zebras don't get ulcer. Why don't they get ulcer? I mean, imagine this zebra that was just attacked by a tiger, by a lion, and somehow it just fled. Now, the zebra is not constantly going to be thinking about what just happened five minutes ago. The zebra is just going to forget about that, um, that event five minutes ago. I'm just going to live life and just be chilling right now. So zebras don't respond to thoughts of lions. They respond only to real lions. Humans, though, we respond to thoughts of lions. That is why zebras don't get ulcer. That's why they can just be sitting the way that they are and they would just be chilling. Humans experience a stress response in relation to thoughts as well as real experiences of threat. Inshallah, one day we'd love just to do an entire segment on just this, on just this topic. What does that even mean? Are we responding to our perception or are we responding to, um, to reality? Children, and, and please for all the people who are attending with us today, children, we can actually foster uh, resilience in, in children, in our communities as well. Um, what characterizes uh, resilience in children? Many things, positive peer and adult interaction. That makes kids actually more resilient. Low degrees of defensiveness and aggressiveness and high degrees of cooperation, participation, and emotional stability, that actually helps children in being more resilient. Positive sense of self, mashaAllah. You know, when a child just, they have that positive sense of self, alhamdulillah, that makes them more resilient. Sense of personal power rather than powerlessness. How do you do that? Let them know that they can make things. Have them help you. See them do things on their own. As you're giving them guidance and support, you don't want to take over. You just want to see them do it. And you know that beaming look they have on their face or on their eyes when they just did it? Dad, dad, look, I did it. I made it. And that is nice when we foster these things in, in children. Internal locus of control. Believe that one is capable of exercising control, impact over the environment. That is really, really nice when we are able to foster these things in, um, in children. Resilience is good. Psychological strength, it can help us adapt and grow from challenges. It is not a fixed state. There's a lot of flexibility there and can be developed and enhanced in all three layers, individuals, family, and community. And you can see, subhanAllah, especially in our, um, and, I, and, I, and I know that we, we spent more time in, in, in defining what resilience is and what it means in an individual. Now you just take that and make it collective. And you know what? Our family is really resilient. What happened? When dad lost his job, subhanAllah, you know what? The kids did so well. When, you know, somebody was diagnosed with this or that, alhamdulillah, our family was able to, adapt and they did so well. When we said that we are moving from that place or to another place, alhamdulillah, you know, as a family, we were able to, to do that. That is really, really nice that, you know, um, imbibing and, 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 and inviting that sense of resilience into our families. And the same thing is also said about our, um, about our, um, about our communities. So inshallah, with this, I will stop. And, and I, my apologies again. I just took a long time um, in going over this. So um, I hope inshallah, we, 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 we benefited, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And again, um, like I said, Nihas, apologies for taking too long this time again. No problem, Sheikh Yasser. Thank you again for, um, for a great session. 
And I just wanted to remind everyone who's watching this that we do have a workshop coming up with Nami Eastside on actually building community resil resilience. So please look out for that. Um, it'll, it'll be in two weeks on March 23rd, inshallah. Um, okay, so we have a few questions here, Sheikh Yasser. Uh, the first question is, can you speak about how faith can play a role in building a resilient family and a resilient community? Yeah. How can we rise over, over bitterness and trauma to come back stronger? Yeah, so remember most of the things that, we're, that we spoke about um, where actually these are very Islamic values. These are like really, really Islamic values. The idea of that you shall be tested. The idea of the tender plant that the Prophet ﷺ spoke about. The idea, that, the idea that amazing and wonderful are the affairs of a believer. He is either in the state of shukr, gratitude, or he or she is in the state of sabr, patiently persevering. So now what we want to look what we want to do is that we want to actualize our religious beliefs. Something that I, I say, and it's always scary because I myself, I am guilty of it. And I say this fully knowing myself. If what we believe in does not impact how we behave, then what we believe in is not important. So now what happens is that we can speak all these sweet talks and how brilliant is the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how. And so what happens is that by the end of the day, it really needs to be actualized. It needs to be put into action. So this woman lost her son and she's just wailing by the grave of her loved one. That's like her baby just passed away. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam passed by and he said, Isbiri Amatullah. He said, you know, uh, patiently persevere um, oh, you know, servant of Allah. Remember, he didn't say don't be sad. He didn't say don't cry. He just said patiently persevere. And the woman not paying attention, she said, just, just you know, get out of here. You don't know what it is that I'm going through. So it's very easy for you to just, you know, throw advices at people. And then when she calmed down, people went to her and they said, by the way, do you know who said that to you? That was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh my God, I actually spoke this way to the Prophet, peace be upon him, runs to the Prophet of Allah and she says, Prophet of Allah, I am sorry. I did not know it was you. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, no scolding, no blaming, no criticizing, no. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, He said that truly patient, patience is, is exercised at the very beginning of that, of that, of that calamity. Simply because after everything subsides and everything calms down, that yeah, you have to be patient back at that point, then it's good, but it's not really the best thing. So similarly, people who are resilient, they come out better, not bitter, they come out better. Not full of resentment, but full of optimism. And I think these are the kind of things that we are, these are the kind of things that we are looking for. You know, people just coming out and being sweeter than they were, being gentler than they were, and being nicer than they were. What happened to that? Look, man, you know, subhanAllah, I went through that experience and it was just so unbelievably uh, trying and, and, and alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, you know, I was able to overcome, I was able to, um, to, to go through these things. And alhamdulillah, they came out nicer and, and, and better and not, and not bitter. So this is what faith asks us to do. It said that give glad tidings to the sabirin. And they're not just people who utter these statements, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi wa but they also act, act upon it. So their attitude is a good attitude. Thank you, Sheikh Yasser. And I also just wanted to follow up by saying next week's topic is actually about uh, healing families and the trauma that families um, have. So the, this is a good follow-up to that question as well. Yes, nice. Okay, uh, last question uh, for today is, there have been whole communities who are currently experiencing collective trauma. Palestinians, Muslims in India, Uyghur, Mus Uyghur Muslims in China, and so many other places. May Allah make it easy on them. Um, How did they rise over this trauma to re-engage and recover from this multi-generational trauma? Yeah. 
Yeah, and and remember, Subhanallah. You know, this is something that we've been um, addressing last time, and that is, you know, what the idea of what how does the Deen do that? You know, just just generally speaking, like how does Islam address these issues? And there are these, uh, you know, um, tools that that the Deen has has um, has given us. Number one is treating the entire thing as uh, not only as individuals, but as one body, like the Prophet ﷺ said, said that the parable of the believers in their mutual love, kindness, compassion to one another is like one body. When one part of it aches, the entire body responds, um, responds to that. And what makes it now at that point is that this idea of collectiveness, that people, you know what, they respond by feeling your pain or they respond by responding to your pain. That in itself can be an extremely healing thing to do. And like you said, that is part of what we will be talking, um, will be talking about. Unfortunately, too many people and the examples that were given are just brilliant examples. Think of all the Iraqis who have been experiencing this trauma for the next, for the past 30 years you know, since 9-11, 20 years, okay? Or maybe since the uh, Iran-Iraq war, and that goes for the Iranians as well. Think of the Syrians, think of the Palestinians, of the Kashmiris, think of the Rohingya, think of the Uyghur, think of the Palestinians. And you can just, the list can just go on and on and on and on. So when we speak about resilience, overcoming trauma, we're not looking for a quick fix. So what happens is, what you look for is that you want some kind of stability, and that is when the real work starts at that point. After that, you know what, that's when the real work starts. And how do you do that? Like I said, first thing that we like to do, and I can tell you this as a clinician, many times we have support groups for people who are like victims of torture, for example, victims of uh, human trafficking, victims of uh, assault, or some of these refugees who came from war-torn areas. So the first thing that we do is that you have people sit together, shared experience. That is a very, very powerful tool. You create a safe environment where people can exchange and they can talk about their experiences. And what happens with shared experiences usually is I don't need a lot of explanation, elaboration on my part. So I say that, and every time we heard the planes flying low, it was, and everybody knows what that is like. I know what does it feel like, you know what, when somebody's banging your door at 2 a.m., when the planes are flying low, when we heard the explosion. And what you see there is a lot of people saying, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, I remember that. So in this, in this sharing, that is how the healing begins. When people come in and they have these shared experiences, they validate one another. They speak about their pain. By the way, the Prophet وسلم, one time Aisha was sitting, she said, Prophet Allah, what is the most difficult day you have faced in your life? That's such a nice question. It's like, you would ask the Prophet of Allah, it was, what did he say? I had the Lord on my side all the time. I never had difficult days. She said, what was the most difficult day you faced? And then what does the Prophet ﷺ say? He really does mention, what does he say? The day my son Ibrahim died. The day my beloved Khadija died. The day my uncle Abu Talib died. When I saw my uncle Hamza being killed. When, what does he say? He said one time, it was when I went to Ba'if, he said. I went, this like, this gets really, you know, when people say that, you know, somebody's getting vulnerable, they're talking about like the most difficult part that they've had. This is like the Prophet وسلم, getting vulnerable. This is like him telling us about, we would have never known this if nobody asked that question. Said, well, it is the day I went to Ta'if. Said, I went to Ta'if to call the people of Ta'if to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the leaders of Ta'if, when they saw me coming, said not only did they reject me, but they sent their servants and their children to chase me, throwing pebbles and rocks at me. And here they are chasing the Prophet of Allah, throwing rocks and pebbles at him. And then he said that the Prophet was bleeding. 
He said that here I am running away from them. I'm going to call them to something good. Yet they, they're, they're chasing me with pebbles. They're chasing me with rocks. And the Prophet ﷺ comes back and he, is, and he is bleeding. He said that this was the most difficult day. You know the idea of just creating um, that, giving people the opportunity to inform others about their, about their pain and what has happened to them. That can actually be an extremely uh, powerful tool. However, the sad part of it is that we actually, through our phones, we can know firsthand immediately live into what is happening to them. And it just leaves you at a, um, it leaves you very impotent. It's like, you know, what, what am I going to do? What, what can I do? I see what is going on with the Uyghurs in China. I know what's happening to my brothers in India and what is going on to the Palestinians. So to the best of our ability, where we are with what we have. Some people saying that I am no longer buying French. I'm no longer buying Chinese. I am no longer supporting this. I'll make sure that I, in whatever way I am able to show my, my, my anger and my solidarity, I will, I will do that. And please do not belittle any of these actions. Thank you, Sheikh Yasser. Um, I just wanted to also just let everyone know that Sheikh Yasser does have, um, does have one-on-one -on -one appointments available uh, for um, for consult for uh, mental uh, for emotional wellness con consultations and I put the link in the chat on zoom but it's also available on our website as well um, and as always Sheikh Yasser fills up really quickly so make sure to uh, schedule your appointment as soon as you can um, with that thank you Sheikh Yasser um, for for being here and for for, for imparting this knowledge on us. I, I know we all really appreciate it and we look forward to building more on this next week, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, jazakumallah khair and to all of our viewers out there. And inshallah, we'll see you next week. And assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum